Okay, cool. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, now, and people can trickle in uh, as they come. I just have a good number of slides. I want to make sure we get through all of them. In the beginning, it's more uh, beginner stuff anyway. Um, and then we'll get into more things like, uh, well, you'll see, but incorporating off-the-shelf hardware into your parts and things of that nature, uh, which are a bit more complex. So thanks for joining, everybody. Um, I'm, my name's Evan. I work at Neometrics Technologies. I'm a 3D printing um, sales consultant specialist <laughs> kind of guy. Uh, we're, today we're going to be taking a, a look at designing for 3D printing, uh, specifically for industrial applications, uh, so things that you're going to use on the shop floor or, or even end-use parts. Um, so getting the most out of the 3D printer you have now uh, through smart design, incorporating technologies that are are not just what your printer offers, uh, but more. Um, so the printers that we're going to be focusing mainly uh, for this presentation are going to be the Mark Forged uh, line of 3D printers and composites, uh, and maybe even some metal. But a lot of these principles uh, you'll use for pretty much any 3D printing technology, especially if it's a, a fused deposition modeling style. So let's get started here. If my presentation will click through. Cool. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. Why do we use 3D printing? Why is 3D printing um, replacing traditional manufacturing in some applications, uh, but not others? And in what areas should we be looking in? Um, how to go from uh, your design to printing in 15 minutes. Usually it's even a lot less than that, but taking your design, optimizing it for 3D printing, and then getting it on your printer. What does that process look like? I will look at a few examples and then adapting existing uh, designs that you already have for other machining processes for 3D printing. Um, and then going over, like I said before, a few tips and tricks uh, for incorporating off the shelf hardware and equipment uh, into your parts to make them stronger. And then uh, lastly, just a case study uh, from one of our customers uh, that did exactly this. And we'll just walk through their whole process and hopefully give you a few ideas to bring uh, bring home back to your shop. So why do we use uh, 3D printing in the first place? So it, a lot of people take a look at 3D printing and, and they think, all right, well, I can print this part in plastic, um, but I might have to replace it way more often than I would if I, if I just machined it out of metal. So yes, I can spend maybe only 10 to 15 minutes designing it and throwing it on the printer. Uh, but if I took the time to tool up, um, program uh, my machine and, and cut it out of metal, I don't have to you know, do one every week or so. So the idea is uh, for this presentation is we want to take a look at what uh, areas um, are best used for 3D printing on the shop floor, what kinds of tools you should be looking at, what types of end use parts, and then why you're going to use 3D printing over machining in those situations. So for the most part, um, if you can get a part of the same uh, strength or at least enough for the application that you're looking for, uh, the biggest uh, save that you have is time. So when you're designing a part uh, for machining, typically you're going through multiple iterations before you get to your final design. And each time you do so, you're having to send things out either outsource uh, or get in line uh, at, uh, for your in-house machine shop, uh, get in the queue for, for getting your part back to you. So your your time from design to part is actually quite lengthy, especially if when you're outsourcing, uh, you have to go through your whole uh, internal PO and RFQ process. And then um, your parts then suffer because let's say you have uh, a new part that you need to design and you have to get it out the door in three months you can only go through, uh, based off of how long it takes for you to, just, to go from design to part, you can only go through a certain number of itera uh, sorry, iterations before um, you have to use whatever that final design is. Uh, but with 3D printing, what we do is we're eliminating a lot of the time costs uh, of machining tooling. So for example, this is what a typical uh, workflow might look like for getting one uh, iteration back for traditional manufacturing. You design your part in CAD, um, you create your, your drawing, and, and uh, you tool up, and you uh, have to wait in your backlog for your, either your internal process 
or you send things out uh, outsource and you have to wait a couple of weeks to get them back. Uh, the tool gets machined and then eventually you get it delivered. So we take a look at this whole process as the total machine production time, right? With 3D printing, it's a lot simpler of a process. Uh, you basically, you're just exporting your, your CAD as an STL, putting it in the slicing software and it prints on its own. Uh, there's a lot less of these in-between steps that you have to go through. So your total time is really just the 10 to 15 minutes of, of putting it through your slicer and then uh, whatever that total print time would be. So when compared to that uh, total machine production time, uh, you, you're able to get multiple iterations through within the same uh, timeline that you would. Uh, so you end up with both a better part uh, or if you get it right on the first time, you save a significant amount of time. So 3D printing is not for every application, right? You have to keep in mind that uh, traditional manufacturing exists uh, because for, for things like high volumes, for example, it's a much better uh, uh, option than something like 3D printing. A uh, 3D printed part, if you make one or if you make a thousand, it's going to cost you essentially the same every single time you make that part. Uh, but once you make the tool uh, for your uh, traditional manufacturing or casting, uh, that tool is really the expensive part. And then every uh, additional uh, piece you make after that, your cost per part lowers and lowers and lowers. So if you're making something that's hundreds uh, to thousands of parts uh, per year, let's say, 3D printing really doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so you have to take a look at what parts are we printing uh, ones uh, all the way up to maybe 50 in a year. And those are the parts that you should be really honing in on for 3D printing. Uh, things like uh, machining, casting, and other uh, traditional manufacturing methods are uh, not getting replaced by 3D printing, but instead you're adding another tool to your arsenal, uh, which is allowing your shop to run more efficiently, and it helps you get to market much faster. So let's take a look at CAD uh, to 3D printing in 15 minutes. What does this look like? Uh, how do we take an existing design or uh, a new design that we're working on and get it on the printer uh, in a very quick amount of time? So your workflow is going to look a lot like this. You're going to start in whatever uh, CAD software you use. Uh, you're going to design your part. You're going to export it out as an STL to your slicing software. Uh, it's going to you, you choose your settings in there, uh, and then it generates the code that your machine will then use to, to print your part. Um, so here are a couple of, or, or three rather, uh, end effectors for a robotic uh, arm here. It's made to pick up this part. Uh, it's a Dixon valve cast uh, coupling. Uh, and these pieces uh, previously were machined. Uh, they were not quick change like you can, you can see here at the top. Uh, these are quick change tools. Uh, and Dixon Valve was going through a whole uh, redesign of, of the way that they manufacture their parts. And they wanted to optimize their line by having all these new quick change end effectors so they can swap out uh, and change over in, in under 24 hours their entire line. Uh, but to get all of these new uh, quick change jaws machined, each one of them would cost you know several hundred dollars because for each um, uh, each coupling uh, design that they had, they had to get a whole new set made. Uh, and they only have, let's say, three to 12 of, of each design, uh, right? Uh, you know, something like this, they might have only a couple of arms, so they don't need this exact same design. Hundreds of them, they only need a few of them. Um, so instead of machining them, they thought, well, why don't we 3D print? Uh, so let's take a look at the process that they went through to get there. Uh, they started just with a generic uh, gripper shape that they knew uh, was the template that they wanted to begin with. This is something they already had uh, in mind from when they were designing for machining. Uh, and then they took the, they, they imported the, the piece that they're designing this specific tool for. Um, and then you, know, you select it and you Boolean it out from your original design. So what you're left with here is, uh, yes, this is, you know, the, the piece that would pick up your part, uh, but it's not optimized and it's not cleaned up. Uh, so for 3D printing, things like these sharp edges that you see uh, don't print well. Uh, obviously, they wouldn't machine well either. Uh, so we just need to do a quick cleanup by adding, adding uh, chamfers and fillets 
uh, so everything's a bit smoothed out, uh, but you still maintain that shape. Another thing you might notice here is they've extruded out these areas uh, for these shaft keys, uh, because what they realized is over time, picking up and putting down these metal pieces um, was wearing out the plastic very quickly. Uh, and then this is something that we're going to touch on a bit more later uh, in the presentation. But essentially, uh, you're, if you're designing a part that's going to be replacing a metal gripper like this, for example, um, it, it was made metal to begin with for a reason. The reason uh, for this specific application was, you know, they wear out very quickly. Um, but by taking your very simple off the shelf uh, piece that you can get off a of McMaster for a couple cents, uh, you can design in uh, pieces like this um, that will act as the wear surface while the rest of the gripper just is a uh, support. So it, it, it holds the part, but the part is actually only touching that, these shaft keys here. Uh, so you get the design that you want quickly and cheaply, um, and you get the, the features that are critical um, made from the material that you need. So just like that, then they can then upload it into Iger, which is the Mark Forge slicing software or whatever slicing software your printer uses, um, and then print it out. So uh, from here, uh, I, I just want to show you real quickly in Iger. It's a very simple process. You choose your material uh, on the Mark Forge system. You're mainly going to be using Onyx, which is a nylon with chop fiber. Uh, you can reinforce parts uh, with continuous strands of composite fibers. And you just select your printer here. Most of the settings will remain on default. And it gives you your uh, print time, material cost, uh, and all the other data that you would need. So then you just hit print, and then with the Mark Forge system, everything is cloud-based, so it goes right to your printer. You don't even have to get off, um, you know, at, off your seat and walk over there if you've already got everything set up on the machine. So let's take a look at uh, this reset on me. I just want to quickly dive into continuous fiber fabrication um, just so you get an idea of what I'm talking about on the Mark Forge system. Uh, so things like those off-the-shelf inserts that I was talking about before you can use to add strength to your 3D printed parts. A nice thing about the Mark Forge system is a lot of that uh, added strength can be put into the part with the, the hardware that Mark Forge provides. And what that means is you're adding continuous strands of composite fibers into your plastic parts similar to a skeleton in your body, giving it shape or uh, concrete and rebar relationship. Basically, you're, you're getting the strength of that continuous fiber, similar to if you had uh, um, those, those metal shaft keys in there, you're getting the strength from those. Uh, it's, it's a very similar relationship, uh, but these are impregnated into your part, so you don't actually see them uh, once your part is completely finished. Um, and, and these pieces here, uh, that I was showing you before are filled actually with a continuous uh, Kevlar. Um, so they have a much higher strength than a standard plastic part. Uh, and they're, they do well over time uh, with, with impact um, and, and other high strength and high stress uh, applications like this. So uh, internally, let's take a look at what this looks like. So here's the part uh, in CAD. Let's just take a cross section of this guy. Um, and this is what it would look like once you impregnate those fibers. So a lot of you that 3D print on the regular uh, recognize that uh, that lattice infill structure. Uh, but these yellow lines that you see around the outside are actually those continuous strands of Kevlar. Uh, so those add uh, a large amount of strength to the part as a whole. Uh, you get up to 22 times stronger than something like an ABS once you start adding in these uh, these fibers. So uh, this is this is what it looks like in the software. And then when it actually prints, you can see here uh, what the continuous strands do look like. So you can have them around the perimeter of your part, uh, concentric rings. You can have them isotropic, you know, going back and forth and changing by 45 degrees. Every layer it goes down. It all depends on your application and the stresses that are going to be on that part. You would choose how you would orient your fiber. And here it is in the printer. I just paused halfway through the print. So let's talk about ad adapting existing designs for 3D printing. Um, this is more, more going to be going into off-the-shelf hardware uh, that you can use for any 3D printing technology you have. Uh, a lot of these work best with fused deposition modeling, uh, especially when you start doing heat set inserts. 
and things of that nature because you're already working with a thermoplastic. Uh, so melting it down and putting something in it isn't that difficult. Uh, so let's take a look at threaded features, um, what to do when you have uh, overhangs or, or cantilevers, uh, some surface finish requirements, and then um, just things that you can do to add additional strength to your, your parts. Uh, so when it comes to threaded features, everyone's big question is always, can I print threads? Uh, a lot of technologies you can. Uh, 3D printing has gotten far enough right now um, that for a lot of thread sizes, you actually can 3D print them. Uh, is that always the best answer, especially when, when you're printing something that's you're going to be um, you know, screwing something in and out multiple times? No, uh, I, I usually don't recommend that people th uh, print threads, even if they look great and they work great for the first time you use it. It might be better just to use something off the shelf. So take a look at your um, your application and then depending on how much uh, strength you need in those threads and how often you're going to be using it, that'll help you decide if you're going to print it or tap it, uh, or if you can use an insert. And then if you are using an insert, which one's the most optimal for your design? So from, from left to right, we're looking at sort of the strongest, but also hardest to implement, all the way to easiest to implement, but also weakest. So you can see the pull strength increases as you move down the line. Um, you know, just tapped or printed threads are fairly weak. Uh, don't have a lot of pull strength. Helical inserts are a little bit better, but still not great. Uh, but the profile is small and they're very easy to install. Uh, you can use captive nuts uh, that you see here, uh, which are also a great option uh, for adding strength, especially in the Z axis. Or you can use a heat set insert like I talked about before. Um, usually the directions for design for for these uh, are in McMaster. So let's say you're using this heat set insert, it'll tell you exactly how to design uh, where it goes so that when you push it in, it works exactly as you want. Basically the way that we do it and the way that everyone else will is uh, you take a soldering iron and you heat it up uh, with the tip and then you just press it into your part. As you can see here, uh, here's one in action. So I know I had mentioned that this is the, uh, this is the hardest to install, um, but for things like like uh, threads that are that are essential to your part, uh, let's say that's a critical feature, and you know that you need as much pull strength as possible, it's not that difficult. Um, as you can see here, it, I mean, basically you take your part uh, after you have the design put in there for uh, the hole that it's going to go into. Basically, just press a uh, soldering iron into it, and you get a very strong thread uh, without having to uh, make your part out of metal. So if those threads are the only uh, the only critical feature of your part that really needs that metallic strength or that high pull strength, I highly recommend using a heat set insert. Um, another another option would be captive nuts. I mean, this is even even easier, as you can just have um, an area cut out for for the nut and then have a bolt go through your part and screw it in. So something like this tool, uh, which we're going to get into uh, in a bit, uh, it's a bending tool. Um, we have strength, obviously, in the X, Y axis uh, with that composite fiber uh, that we were laying down earlier. Uh, however, in all methods of 3D printing, or at least in most of them, especially uh, fused deposition modeling, your Z axis is always going to be much weaker. Um, and that's because you're only as strong as the adhesion between these layers. So uh, what we've done for this specific part is, since we wanted isotropic strength throughout this part, we had all of these captive nuts put in and bolts uh, throughout the parts so that the Z axis is now as strong as these bolts. You can also design in, um, let's say you want to put magnets in your part or uh, other embedded components. You design in those features uh, and then you just have a pause uh, put in at that specific layer. So when they come off, you can pull the, the uh, print bit off, you can put your, your uh, embedding components in there and then have it print right over them. Uh, once again, uh, helical, helical inserts are great because they're they're easy to install and they have a very uh, low cross-sectional profile. Uh, they don't offer a much higher increase in pull-out strength. Uh, it does have a higher increase in wear resistance. So if you don't need a lot of pull-out strength, um, but you're going to be uh, 
screwing something in and pulling it out multiple times at many, many operations, it might make sense to throw in one of these helical inserts um, just to save you from having to reprint the part once those threads wear out. So a key takeaway I would say is yes, you can 3D print threads in a lot of places, but usually it's a lot easier to just go ahead and use an off the shelf part uh, for it. That's our recommendation. Uh, obviously, if you have something that's like an M3 uh, or larger and it doesn't need a lot of pullout strength, you can typically achieve that with, with nylon threads or, or whatever uh, base plastic you're using. I highly recommend, though, if you're going to be creating a tool and you want it to have a robust uh, you know, use and you don't want it to wear out in the first couple of uh, uh, times that you, you're using it, use an off-the-shelf piece. They're, they're easy to install. They're not they're not just good for the, the single installation. Uh, they'll last you way longer than the part itself. Um, but if you have any questions also, um, when you're designing for these, I'm going to have my email at the end. Uh, send your designs over to us. We can take a look at it, and we can offer our, our expertise as well. Um, and I can send this chart out also if anyone's interested. Basically, it just tells you the strengths and weaknesses of each of these types of uh, off-the-shelf inserts. So for, like I was saying, heat set is the best for pull-out strength. Uh, square nut might be better for torque-out strength um, and ease of installation. Uh, hex nut, uh, ease, of, ease of installation as well. Um, and then you can see as you get closer to printed, you start losing a lot of these um, strengths, but it makes it a lot easier to do. So you have to balance the application versus the amount of effort that you want to put in. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about support material. This is fairly universal unless you have a system that has dissolvable supports. Um, but basically, anytime you have an overhang or a bridge, uh, your, your cantilevers are going to require support underneath them. Um, a way to, and, and what support will do is it's going to add a lot of material cost and print time uh, to, to your prints. So what you can do to combat this is you can chamfer um, these cantilevers so that you don't have um, support structures underneath them. And for most systems, something like a 45 degree angle like you see here uh, is enough to eliminate the need for supports. Right. Unless you get into uh, metal 3D printing uh, where you're going to have parts sitting in a furnace or something along that, those lines, you typically don't need to have uh, supports uh, of, once the overhang is more than 45 degrees. Uh, if you have internal channels or uh, holes that you don't want supports through, what you can do is you can have a teardrop profile uh, or a diamond profile as opposed to just a typical hole. Uh, this will eliminate the need for support material, but allow you to have a channel that runs throughout your part. So, uh, you know, an application, uh, real world use case of this uh, would be this vacuum end of arm tool. Um, so what's nice about this thing is they actually 3D printed all those internal channels and those teardrop shapes because they were trying to eliminate uh, all the tool, uh, tubing that they would have to put in that part afterwards. So it, it significantly reduces the complexity and the cost of this part. You can print it all in one piece as about, opposed to printing in multiple pieces and adding all these tubes. And this is what it looks like. Uh, sorry, I, I thought they used the uh, teardrop. They actually used diamond channels throughout this one. But no support was generated, uh, so they were able to use this part as is with uh, likely little to no cleanup after it came off the print per per bed. So like I was saying before, your Z-axis is always going to be your weakest because you're only as strong as the adhesion between your layers. Uh, so something that you can do to com combat that is uh, adding bolts uh, for Z-axis strength. Um, so you can see here, uh, for this specific part, um, Obviously, it would print best in the orientation that you see in the middle here, uh, standing upright. However, that leaves you uh, with some critical features that are that are weak. Um, so we just put a bolt through it. Now you have isotropic strength throughout your part. Um, if you're using a Mark Forge system, you can add composite fibers under the bolt head and, and the nut, and that'll distribute the compression that you have. If you don't use a Mark Forge system, uh, what you can do is just use off-the-shelf uh, inserts to distribute the compression as well. Um, and that's something that's also incredibly easy uh, to install. 
So this is the part that we were discussing earlier. The CNC two bending die. We reinforced it uh, with the same captive nuts that you were looking at earlier, uh, and now they were able to get this part. Instead of machining this out of a block of um, whatever uh, metal that they would use, they, they can now 3D print multiple designs and test them all out, and it's going to perform very similarly. Um, because they don't necessarily need steel strength on this part. Aluminum might be good enough. And with uh, all these different features that we've added into it, it now performs just as well as, as the, the parts that they were machining before. So as a key takeaway, um, before we get into another real world example, is whenever you're 3D printing a part and you think to yourself, uh, you know, I have to machine this. I need the, the properties of that metal. Um, just think what features specifically on your part require that strength is it something that you could if it's only uh, like a wear service for example can you add shaft keys uh, can you add dowel pins into your design uh, if it's something like uh, i need isotropic strength can you add uh, bolts into your your tools um, to, to give it the, the strength in the z-axis while also maintaining strength in, in, in xy can i put a uh, um, can have an insert embedded into my part, uh, like a bracket, for example, to give it added strength. You know, think about these things uh, more when you're designing more of these one-off tools. And you might save yourself a lot of time in the long run uh, if you're able to 3D print them. So let's look at a fast tool iteration um, with 3D printing. Uh, this is the same company, Dixon Valve. Uh, this time we're looking at uh, grippers that pick the same exact parts up, but this time from the inside of these threads. Uh, they were wearing incredibly fast because threads are sharp. <laughs> so they were tearing up uh, the plastic um, that, that these tools are made from. Uh, so initially, their goal was, well, let's just add maybe a couple of dowel pins around the, the perimeter here, and, and we can get um, a better wear surface than whatever this, this plastic they were using is. However, uh, once they, they put in only one or two of these, you, you're now seeing um, wear on your part because the, the um, force is not being distributed across uh, many of these little tiny surfaces. Instead, they only have one on each gripper. Uh, so that was the original solution that they, they, they 3D printed and, and, and put it on the field. Uh, but now it's damaging the ID of these threads. So um, ordinarily, this would be a huge headache because now we're having to send this part back out uh, to get machined again and, and sent back to us. Uh, it's taking us another three weeks to get through another iteration. However, with 3D printing, now they're able to redesign it uh, almost instantaneously. Um, so in, in 15 minutes now, they have their new tool designed and it's already on the printer printing. Uh, so the baseline that I was talking about before, they only had two of these dowel pins uh, per uh, each of the tools, and they were seeing a lot of wear on their threads. Uh, but by adding more and more uh, over time, they were able to go through, let's say, now three iterations in a matter of three to four days, uh, and they were able to end up with this optimal design, as opposed to if they had um, machined this, they wouldn't even have their first part back to them at this point. So once again, I just want to hone in on if you have a part and you think you can't 3D print it, think about why. You know, what are the features that that make it something that you can't make out of plastic? And then take a look at um, you know things like off-the-shelf parts and, and and really think about your options because uh, typically you have a lot more options than, than you think. <laughs> so if you have a 3D printer right now. Um, and you're thinking of more ways to use it in, in industrial applications, take a look at some of your tools, uh, take a look at some of the parts that you use on the shop floor that you make out of maybe a 6061 aluminum right now. Um, and you make it out of metal because it needs to be stronger than plastic, but it doesn't necessarily utilize all the strength of that metal. Think about why you use it. Um, think about the, the critical features. And, and if you're able to you know, try out some of these, Feel free to use this as a resource. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat, um, and you'll be able to uh, reach out to us anytime, and, and we'll try to help. <laughs> That's what we're here for. So I'm going to switch over 
Sorry, I have one screen on here, so I can't see all the questions. <laughs> but if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Let me know. Um, I'm going to put my email here as well. If you have a tool that you want to discuss for 3D printing, uh, or if you want to learn more about the MarkForge system, uh, either one, feel free to email me anytime. Um, I will give this another five or so minutes to see if any questions filter in. We don't have any right now. Uh, but if not, thank you for joining us. I hope uh, you learned a thing or two that you can take away and, and get more use out of your printer this week. All right, looks like no questions. Um, if you guys do end up trying any of these uh, options that you saw on here um, and, and getting some success with them, send me some pictures. Uh, shoot me an email um, with a picture of, of your part. I'd be glad to see that uh, some of the suggestions that we, we offered uh, helped you guys. Um, but other than that, have a great rest of your week. I uh, hope everyone is staying safe out there. and. Uh, just be on the lookout for our next webinar it should be on uh, 3D scanning.